right. Well, we seem to have a good number of people here, so I think we will get started on today's second session in putting the policy into practice. A series of webinars and workshops talking about the tri-agency's RDM policy and how you can put that into effect at your institution. In today's session, which is part two, as I mentioned, we are going to be talking about data deposit. The third tri-agency RDM pillar covers data deposit. This webinar will cover issues surrounding data deposit, including what it is and what it isn't, benefits to data deposit, and what is meant by the requirement in the tri-agency RDM policy. Examples of data repositories for available for use by Canadian researchers will be discussed. And as yesterday, the formal presentations will be followed by an open office hour session for questions and discussion. My name is Jennifer Abel. I am the training coordinator for the Alliance RDM team. And I'm here on behalf of the Institutional Strategies Workshop Working Group in the Portage uh, Network of Experts National Training Expert Group. And I'd like to also acknowledge that the land that I'm speaking to you from is the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh. A few housekeeping notes before we get started in earnest. You have been muted automatically when you entered the room. This webinar is being recorded and the chat may be archived for those who are unable to attend. We encourage you to use the latest version of Zoom so that you have access to all of the features, including security updates. However, as I've mentioned, if, you, if it asks you to update in the middle of the session, maybe wait until afterwards so you can enjoy the full experience. Please use the chat feature if you're having technical difficulties or have additional resources to share. And please use the Q&A option to ask questions of the presenters. Questions will be addressed at the end of the session, as I mentioned. You can also raise your hand if you wish to ask a question. Questions may be asked in English or in French. Please note that simultaneous interpretation is available for this session and that the live transcript feature is also enabled. Uh, the slides for this session are available on the, on the event webpage, which you'll be getting a link for in the chat momentarily, uh, as well as through a Google folder, which you'll also be getting a link for the chat in the chat for momentarily. Um, at the moment, um, due to some timing constraints, we only have English slides, uh, although our first presenter's slides are just about entirely bilingual. We will be posting the French slides as soon as possible. Thanks for your understanding. Uh, we have a code of conduct that we follow in this, in this webinar session. Uh, we are seeking to provide a welcome, welcoming, engaging, and safe community for everyone. Discriminatory language is not appropriate and we don't tolerate harassment in any form. By harassment, we understand that as any behavior that threatens another person or group or produces an unsafe environment. So please play nicely with each other while you're here. Now, we have four speakers in today's session. Uh, our first speaker is going to be Jeff Moon, who is the director of the Digital Research Alliance of Canada's RDM team, and previously served as director of the Canadian Association of Research Libraries Portage Network. Uh, in case you didn't know, Portage officially joined uh, the Alliance on April 1st, 2021. Prior to his role with Portage, Jeff served as the data librarian at Queen's University Libraries, as academic director of the Queen's Research Data Centre, and established and managed the Queen's Research Data Management Service. I should just start saying RDM, that will be easier. Uh, Bo Wanschneider is with us from the University of Toronto, where he is the Chief Information Officer. And he has over 30 years of experience that spans three higher education institutions. Bo has a graduate degree in economics as a, and has gone from the lone IT person in, a, in an academic department with a focus on computational analytics and data management to being the CIO. Bo builds collaborations across institutions as well as within. He has a long history in RDM and sits on many governance and working groups from Research Data Canada to the Digital Repositories Expert Group. Karen Payne is the Associate Director for Inter International Technology for the World Data System, a component of the International Science Council, which is hosted at the University of Victoria. Her role is to help WDS member institutions build out their contributions to the global research data infrastructure. 
Prior to joining the WDS, Karen worked at the University of Georgia, providing data services to the humanitarian community involved in disaster relief and recovery activities. And Danielle Cooper is the Associate Director for Libraries, Scholarly, Scholarly Communication and Museums at Ithaca SNR, where she oversees a team specializing in information and technology practices in higher education and cultural in organizations. Ithaca SNR is a US-based not-for-profit re research organization that helps academic and cultural communities serve the public good and navigate economic, technological, and demographic change. And prior to joining Ithaca, uh, Danielle worked as a librarian at Ryerson, now X University, and George Brown College while pursuing her doctoral studies at York University. And with that, Jeff, you're starting us off and the virtual pixelated floor is yours. There we go. Can you hear me okay? Yep, all good. Okay, and can you see the first slide? All yep, good? we can see that too. Okay, I have got my control bar is blocking my screen. Here we go. We'll get this going here. All right, well, first of all, Thank you all for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm really excited to be here. We've got, by last count, upwards of 300 people joining us on this call. Um, so welcome to you all. Bienvenue et merci pour l'opportunité de vous parler aujourd'hui. Let me start by acknowledging that I am speaking to you from Kingston, Ontario, as a member of the Queen's University community. Queen's University is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory, and we are certainly grateful to be able to live, learn, and play on these lands. If I can get my screen to move. Here we go. So good research data management can certainly be summed up as making research data fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, and by both humans and machines. Um, in this, against this backdrop, certainly the tri-agencies, which is uh, what we're here to talk about, the tri-agency RDM policy, the goal is to help researchers and institutions meet their research data management needs. And a focal point of our efforts has been in addressing at the Alliance and formerly Portage, addressing the requirements of the recently launched tri-agency RDM policy, which has both institutional and researcher facing requirements. The things that we've been involved in doing, which are being covered off in the workshop series this week, are an RDM strategy development template, which we'll be talking more about tomorrow. Data management planning, which was covered very ably by uh, James Duaron yesterday. And today, looking at the data deposit uh, requirement of the tri-agency policy. And in the context of this, we are supporting disciplinary and some national multidisciplinary repository options for researchers in Canada. So who do we serve? We serve researchers, research administrators, graduate students, research data librarians, and other data specialists. And in this context today, we'll focus primarily on researchers and their need to deposit data under the policy. So, this researcher is asking, what about deposit? I'm supposed to put my data somewhere at the end of my project. Presumably they are funded by one of the tri-agencies. Well, to answer this question, it's useful to look at the research data life cycle. Researchers collect or create data. They process it or clean it. They work through the process of analyzing their data in preparation for publication. And all of this collectively is active storage. And this phase of the research life cycle is where researchers spend most of their time. That active storage phase leads naturally into a dissemination phase. So after the active storage phase of research, researchers should find a place to deposit their data and data should be deposited into a recognized repository. So this dissemination or deposit phase is the second of the two, sorry, the third of the 
three requirements of the tri agency's RDM policy. After deposit into a repository, there may be um, need to preserve the data. Decisions may be made around those data to preserve them for the long term. And this is beyond uh, repository storage and goes into a much more detailed and, and um, involved process of preserving for the long term. Preservation storage involves using software like Archivematica to create uh, normalized packages called archival information packages using, using that software and then depositing those packages into a growing network of preservation service providers. Together, active repository and preservation storage make up the data storage continuum. Our researchers question about where they should put their data generated in the active phase of research speaks specifically to depositing data into repository storage. So next question logically would be, well, which repository should I choose? A researcher's choice of repository will depend on many factors. First of all, if there is a domain specific repository supported by your discipline, this may be the best place to deposit your data. If no domain specific repository exists, we suggest using one of two multidisciplinary repository options supported by the Alliance RDM. And these include Dataverse Canada or the Federated Research Data Repository, also known as FERDER. Dataverse serves the long tail of the research data ecosystem very well, currently housing over three terabytes of data, consisting of over 4,000 data sets and 80,000 files to date from researchers at over 50 institutions and a wide array of disciplines. In contrast, FERDER is purpose-built to meet the repository needs of researchers working with larger data sets, often on high-performance computing scale infrastructure that individual institutions are not often equipped to provide. To date, FERDER houses over 25 terabytes of research data from over 200 projects. So the researcher then asks, how, is, how are people going to find my data? Because putting data into a repository is just one half of it. The other half is discovery and access. So in order to help people discover data, we have to think about reuse. And the reuse element of the data lifecycle involves a number of things. And these include persistent identifiers and discovery portals. So one of two persistent identifiers that the Alliance RDM is supporting our ORCID IDs, which identify researchers, and DOIs or digital object identifiers, which uniquely and uniquely and unambiguously identify data sets. And these two are linked together and in an ecosystem of persistent identifiers to permit better and more ubiquitous access to these data. In terms of discovery portals, um, the further discovery this service has adopted the model of the European Open Air Repository Discovery Service. And so if you went to further.ca, you would find a search box. And in that search box, you would be discovering data from over 90 repositories. So metadata has been gathered up from over 90 different repositories in Canada. Not the data, just the metadata. And so we have repositories like Dataverse, Canada, some open data portals, as well as a number of uh, streams of data from metadata from other major repositories such as Polar Data, Catalog, Data Stream, and CIUS. In addition to that, this index, this discovery layer, provides access to data that are actually deposited within the FERDER repository. And these include data sets such as the Mountain Legacy Project, and data from the Water Institute. In total, there are over 120,000 files deposited into FERDER. And I'm really, I've, I'm always astounded by this statistic. There are over 2.5 million downloads since January of this year. Open Air in Europe, which predated the FERDER discovery system, is now 
home to metadata records from FURTER. These have been uploaded to the open air portal to broaden the scope and access to Canadian research data. So ultimately, the Tri-Agency's third policy pillar, data deposit, is designed to support dissemination, discovery, and reuse of data, Canadian data, in the broader DRI ecosystem. So with that, I will take questions perhaps at the end, and I will turn the floor back over to Jen and, and or to Bo directly, and I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, we can go over to Bo directly now. Great, thanks, Jen, and thanks, Jeff. Uh, I'll just share my screen here. Um, so you should see the picture of Convocation Hall there. We're all good. Um, thanks. So um, coincidentally, um, I'm also coming to you from Kingston today. So uh, I share Jeff's land acknowledgement that he started. Um, as the CIO at the University of Toronto, um, I think it's just worth repeating my, my, my history here a little bit that, that I've been working on RDM since before we probably called it RDM, which was back in the last millennium, so quite, so quite some time. And I don't get to spend as much time on this um, anymore as, as I would certainly like to, but it's something that really energizes me and excites me. And um, seeing these presentations in the series here, um, I find it just amazing at how much progress has been made by, by Portage and now the Alliance and the community uh, as a whole. So uh, I think that's pretty fantastic. Um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of um, information about DRAG uh, around the vision and the objectives, and, and then a little bit of the context uh, of, of digital repositories in Canada, talk about the repository certification um, program, uh, and then we can open it up to, to questions. So DRAG is the Digital Repositories Expert Group. Um, it's part of a network of experts across the country. It was established initially by Carl and Portage and now is part of the Alliance. Um, Carl being the Canadian Association of Research Library. And the group, DREG, is about encouraging growth in the, the repository space to better align with the requirements from the granting councils, such as the, the uh, request to deposit uh, your data. Uh, upon completion of your, your research or before. <clears throat> I've listed out three of the objectives on the right-hand side here. Um, there's a number of objectives that are listed in our terms of reference, but essentially we're trying to provide coordination for the repository-focused working groups to leverage, develop, and promote strengths in both platforms as national repository options. Um, we're also trying to ensure that we decrease uh, duplication. We don't want to reinvent the wheel all over the place. Um, we've certainly all got limited resources and we want to use those as effectively and efficiently as possible. So that's a that's an ambitious goal of, of DREG. And we also want to identify the gaps that exist out there and, and in, in the gaps in training and then try to fill uh, those gaps. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, there are a number of other objectives as well, working with other alliance uh, expert groups like curation and preservation to ensure that repository operations align with other components of the DRR landscape, and also work with international partners to uh, promote cohesion within the global repository landscape and promote things like trust. And, and, we, and Jeff talked a little bit, I think, about that, and I might talk a little bit more um, in the next few slides. Uh, in terms of the repository landscape, there, there's many of them uh, in Canada. There's over 200. Um, there are new ones that come online uh, all the time. Uh, occasionally, we see some of them sort of drop off, um, and that's, that's a little bit concerning to us. So, so one of the question, or some of the questions that we're trying to address is how do we help researchers navigate this space? And that comes back to the, sort of the introduction that Jeff gave. How do we ensure that there's preservation and that these repositories don't just disappear? And then talk a little bit about what's the difference between generalist, domain-specific government uh, repositories. Does it matter? And if so, why does it matter? Uh, again, try to help the research understand uh, where it is that they can deposit their, their data. 
Uh, I'm going to now talk about one of our activities that we're doing. So this is the Research Certifications Project, RCP. Um, basically, it's focused on core trust. Um, core trust aims to promote sustainable and trustworthy uh, data repositories. Uh, it's a data repository certification. The Core Trust Seal is a data repository certification that emerged um, back in about 2018 under the leadership of the Research Data Alliance. It represents a merger of two previous certifications, the Data Seal of Approval and World Data Set of Systems Certification. And it has achieved significant uptake as a community-driven, openly documented and achievable certification. Core Trust aims to promote sustainable and trustworthy data repositories. And our repository certification project is meant to advance Canadian repositories to the certification stage. So in terms of specific outcomes, um, we want to create community, we want to encourage certification, we want to advance uh, the notion of the fair and trust principles. Um, we have a small cohort of repositories uh, who have applied to participate in this particular uh, project. They're creating a community designed to share knowledge and experiences. And at the end of the day, the, the goal is certification, although I don't think that's absolutely uh, a, a prerequisite or a prerequisite of the outcome, but it's certainly trying to push uh, the repositories in that direction. Um, they will be able to share experiences and benefits with the broader community after they've certified and help promote uh, fair and trust principles across the Canadian and international landscape. In terms of DREG, the Digital Repositories Expert Group, we've listed off uh, the members on the right-hand side of this slide. Um, there's a real breadth of, of, of experience here. So we've got experts in data management, in repositories. Uh, we've got researchers as, as well. Um, what I can say is getting to chair this group has been um, a very enriching experience for me. Uh, at each individual meeting, at the end, the different repository um, representatives sort of talk about what's happening in their area, which is incredibly informative, incredibly exciting to hear all the great work that's happening out there in, in the repository space. Uh, in terms of the repository certification project itself, um, we've listed off uh, the funded uh, repositories on the right-hand side. So um, when you applied, uh, if you were a successful applicant, there's a little bit of funding that comes along with that to help you reach certification. Um, we were really excited when we saw the cohort of uh, repositories that submitted. Uh, and we reviewed them. I'd say, from what I hear, the meetings are going very well. It sounds like we've really um, developed a cohort here uh, of individuals, which was the goal. Um, there's been three, or there's three workshops uh, that are planned to move uh, to be to be covered. Um, one's on digital object management curation. One's on digital object management and technology, which is preservation. And then the final one is around organizational policies. In terms of how it's set up. There are pre-workshop chats amongst the cohort. There are pre-workshop readings that are assigned. And then there's also reading groups, writing groups, peer review groups. Um, and in the peer review groups, there's also been a uh, self-assessment uh, form or framework or dashboard, I guess, that's been created. Uh, and, the, and the different repositories are working through that with the goal of having the peers within the group uh, work on that. One measure of success for me in the last meeting we had was the fact that the cohort is asking to spend more time with each other, uh, which is exactly what we wanted to do. And I think that bodes really well for when the project finishes and we would like these repositories to go to the broader community and promote um, trust and fair. There is another part of the cohort. Um, these are the ones that are there just to observe. Uh, they're observing without funding, but they're participating as well, actively as I understand. Um, and we even have an international um, participant from Switzerland. So that brings me to the conclusion of my slides. And I think, as Jeff noted, um, we will hold questions till the end. And then I will um, move over to Karen. Thank you, Bo. That's great. Um... So I'm sorry, I'm having uh, technical camera difficulties. I think my laptop finally gave up the ghost after too many COVID Zoom calls. So uh, Jen's gonna share my slides for me today. And so I apologize for being a headless speaker. 
Um, um, go ahead, Jen, we'll go ahead and start with the acknowledgement and the next slide. Um, but I wanted to start by letting you know that I'm speaking to you today from Victoria, and I would like to acknowledge with respect the Lekwagon peoples on whose territory I stand and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasonic peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. Uh, next slide, please. So I represent the World Data System, um, which is an operational arm of the International Science Council. Uh, the International Science Council, I think, is probably the world's oldest nonprofit, which is based in Paris and promotes science for the public good. Um, the World Data System itself is, is consists of nearly 300 data distribution centers and related entities around the world, um, all of whom manage and distribute data um, across every domain that I can imagine. Um, it's, it's now a requirement for WDS centers to be Cortra SEAL certified, as uh, Bo alluded to, it should give researchers a, a, a lot of confidence in their professional capabilities as a potential uh, place to deposit data. So my intent during this presentation is to discuss some of the elements of the Tri-Council policy on data deposit and drawing on some of the initiatives found inside um, our member repositories. I'm not promoting any of these approaches as sort of a correct solution, but I just wanted to share what's sort of happening and some of how, how people are addressing it. So next slide, please, Jen. <clears throat> the the Tri-Council policy is, um, as Jeff noted, well-rooted in the FAIR principles and has some really broad reaching statements. Um, I think in particular issues surrounding, you know, data security, data preservation, data curation, data access, I think they're all very complex topics in and of themselves. Um, similarly, the, the requirement for what is deposited, data, metadata, and code, adds a, an additional uh, management layer that maybe we haven't traditionally been under the purview of data managers in the past, and so now has to be addressed. And so these um, deceptively simple, powerful sentences contain a multitude of issues um, when people try to actually create implementation solutions. Uh, next slide, please, Jim. So one of the um, primary functions of the data repositories is data curation, and this covers a huge range of activities. Um, and the point I want to make about curation um, and that Jeff alluded to in his slide is that um, it is, uh, can be distributed across organizations and across time. So as an example, um, the WDS member data, the World Data Center for Climate, which is uh, located in Germany, provides uh, central support for the German and European climate research community. And they have this really robust data repository um, that has currently about 1.5 million data sets uh, that have been contributed by researchers. Um, and these data holdings can be searched directly through that repository. Next slide, please, Jim. But in, in addition to that, the WDC also makes a subset of their curated metadata available for harvesting. And then you can see here um, that they've been harvested by the Open Air Repository, which is also a WDS partner member. Um, about 4,500 uh, WDC metadata records uh, can be searched through Open Air. But in this case, Open Air has engaged in additional value-added curation efforts, uh, specifically enhancing the, the WDC metadata using persistent identifiers to link data to related peer-reviewed publications and software. And so again, my point here is that the curation is not a one and done activity and that after the initial quality assurance preparation for data deposit, there's a lot of harmonization in terms of data models and metadata schemas and deduplication um, uh, uh, that, uh, making sure that data providers get credit for, their, for the reuse of their contributions. Um, and so uh, I think that the upshot is that each institution that creates a tri-council data policy will have to decide which of the value-added services are important to them and how and by whom they will be fulfilled um, in order to satisfy the curation mandate, which, which can again be a distributed process. Next slide, please, Jim. Um, moving into data preservation, as Jeff ably explained, storage covers this uh, continuum of active to long-term data archiving, and I'm going to be a little less precise and speak in general about um, data storage and data access. And, and it's difficult for a lot of reasons, and, and uh, right now a lot of our members um, have this issue of increasing volumes of data, um, and it forces uh, data managers and system architects to create a system that uh, keep increasing amounts of data securely stored and available at the same time. So our goal is to create data centers that have low latency and high bandwidth. And as an example of this, we can look at NASA's Earth Observing System Data and Information System, or EODIS. 
um, EODIS is designed as a distributed archive. So there's major facilities um, at, at NASA centers around the US called Distributed Active Archive Data Centers or DACs. So the EODIS project as a whole is a WDS member and individual DACs are also WDS members. Um, and so these are institutions like uh, the National Snow and Ice Data Center, the Alaska Satellite Facility and the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And so NASA has a big data problem across all of these DACs and they've been working on this for a number of years. Um, in 2017, NASA estimated that the archive would, the entire EODIS archive would be over 55 petabytes of data in 2021, this year. Um, and that next year that would nearly double to 103 petabytes in 2022. So, so to manage this, they decided to use a mixture of commercial cloud environments along with their own data centers. And again, I'm not promoting that as necessarily the right solution for everybody. I'm just letting you know how NASA is approaching this problem. So they've signed in agreements with both uh, Amazon Web Services and Google for a data storage, um, in addition to maintaining their own local data centers. Um, generally speaking, my impression is that the uh, Amazon service is more of a general purpose storage system. Um, and that Google contract is about uh, looking for ways to ease analysis of data. So NASA has begun prioritizing and began migrating DAC data in 2019, and that's an ongoing process. Um, and before I talk about the architecture of that solution, I do wanna comment um, on the implications of this from an administrator's point of view. So if you're an administrator who has to create a budget every year, working with commercial entities is really, really difficult because you don't know how much compute or how much data um, your researchers need to access every year. Um, and since the cloud is a, is a pay-as-you-go instance, um, what the EODIS team decided had to do is build a new set of tools to ensure that the system never violates the Anti-Deficiency Act, which is a US law that prohibits government from spending money that has not been appropriated. Um, and so they have a whole new set of tools within this um, distributed archive uh, to make sure that they don't spend money that they don't have. So it's a real marriage of technical and legal and policy frameworks. Uh, next slide, please, Jim. So outside of the administrative considerations, um, I can say that the technical solution that NASA is employing is um, multiple strategies. And they're, uh, to, in order to uh, approach this low latency, high bandwidth um, availability. And they've looked at fog or edge computing um, as, as, a, as a tiered solution, which is um, relatively few large data centers at the top of the pyramid and increasing number of nodes in the mid tier, which are replicates of the larger assets um, that are in turn connected to a huge number of local devices. So the lower you are on the pyramid, generally uh, the lower your storage limits are. So you can think about the cloud at the top as a centralized resource um, that users could connect to directly um, and the edge is a set of replicated set of those resources that are located closer to the researcher, uh, improving the speed and, and associated with moving data around. And so the trick here, of course, from a data manager's point of view is understanding what computing and what curation should be done locally on the device, what resources should be replicated in the edge and what ultimately needs to be sent to the cloud. Next slide, please, Jen. So the strategy requires that managers come up with a way to divide or classify data assets into data that needs to be on tap and potentially cached in a higher number of nodes versus data that can be put in colder storage but is ultimately still accessible. So I can tell you that right now NASA centers are approaching this by making a policy that all new data is hot by default. Um, and so that means that if, you're, if it's new data, it's highly replicated and readily available. And then they track the number of times a data set is accessed or found by a search. And the less a data set is accessed, then it gets ranked lower and is automatically, this is an autom automated curation process. It's automatically moved back for further on storage continuum. Uh, next slide, please, Jim. So the search metrics aren't a foolproof way of determining whether or not a data set, set, a data set should be afforded a hotter status or be more accessible. Um, and one of the things that we're following very closely is, is a project um, that was initiated in the life sciences community and piloted in Europe um, and is currently um, underway globally, and that's the Global Biodata Coalition. Um, this project was created to support funders by having the research community identify what data assets globally are most important. Um, and the community uh, collectively agrees on important data sets that 
uh, should be a priority for um, giving for for uh, continued funding. Um, and I don't think it's their intent to be clear. I don't think it's part of their plan, but I could imagine that the same kind of rubric, um, if, if the data sets, priority data sets have been identified by the community, um, that could be used as part of the decision-making process in terms of where they should be uh, located in a tiered storage system, tiered storage system, excuse me. Um, and then I would also posit one other strategy that I, I haven't seen, although it certainly could live there, live out there somewhere, um, is that we could create a higher number of samples of data sets and add them to hot storage. And the samples then could be used for sort of preliminary analysis and model development and testing with the full data set available from cold storage um, when the researcher is ready to do a, a full run or a full set of analysis. So this adds another distributed curation process um, on top of what already exists and is particularly relevant with workflows where data and computer are highly, highly coupled. Uh, next slide, please, Jim. Um, so I'm gonna shift gears and, and uh, the last thing I wanna talk about is the shift now to um, the track council policy that requires code to be deposited alongside uh, data and metadata. And traditionally data repositories have trafficked in data and code repositories have been developed to deal with code and keeping these assets separate in their own repositories could make sense as long as their relationship of any could, could be maintained. And we saw that, again, talking about the open air repository that maintains a database of the relationship between data and software objects. So um, in light of this, th there's a lot of continued development of, of functionality inside of software repositories that makes a lot of sense. For example, GitHub is working on simultaneous edit editing capabilities, same way that uh, two or more people can uh, edit the same Google Doc. Um, GitHub is trying to make that available for code, uh, multi-user code editing. Um, one question then becomes, what code repository do you want to use, especially one if you're interested in supporting open science? Um, GitHub got a little bit of a backlash from the open science community when it was bought by Microsoft in 2018 for $7.5 billion. Um, uh, Amazon Web Services and Google both have Git repositories, but if you're still looking for open source repositories, um, I think the open source GitLab is probably the easiest port from um, traditional GitHub data sets, or Git, GitHub repositories. So. Um, so that's where we are if you choose to, to go that route. Uh, next slide, please. The other strategy is to package up data and code and publish them together. And we've seen an increased interest in the computational notebooks just for this reason. And I think particularly the American Geophysical Union has really pushed the envelope on notebooks as a first class research object for um, researchers in, in their peer reviewed publications. So notebooks like Jupyter Notebooks or R Markdown documents have a lot of traction because they can package code outputs like figures and tables and text into a single file. Um, these packages can either include data if the data strings are small enough or notebooks can point to data repositories and have embedded tools to help them access that data. So the tools can support either fetching data from the repositories and processing locally, or the tools can be used to containerize the code and send the code to the data to process where it lives. Um, and there's a lot of interesting development in the, in the notebook functionality. For example, um, you can export, export or markdown files as HTML and create a website. Um, you can then store and distribute and version those HTML files in GitHub. You can integrate a, a blog or generate slide decks or publish eBooks or create blended lectures of um, interactive tutorials with a friendly website interface as well. Uh, next slide, please, Jim. So finally, prior to the advance in popularity of notebooks, researchers in some domains have invested heavily in virtual research environments or science gateways. And VREs are an evolution of the portal concept for research communities. Um, they're designed with specific domain like um, material science or genomic research in mind. And they're very large platforms. Um, the, in the world of VREs, what I've seen is the notion of publishing um, data and code encapsulated by publishing workflow documents. So these are reproducible step-by-steps -step that are taken during an analysis within the VRE or whatever the VRE connects to. Um, and there are about 280 different workflow languages around right now, but it seems like the community really seems to be zeroing in on what's known as um, CWL, a common workflow language. Um, and I've seen tools that convert um, Python Jupyter Notebooks to Common Workflow Language, as well as people writing kernels for Jupyter Notebook, which enables the notebook to run 
a common workflow language document. So, so there's ways in which these worlds may be converging in, in some sense. In any event, um, all of these activities, either in VREs or notebooks, uh, creates a whole new curation workload, which is how to organize and, and discover them. Um, so last slide, I think I'll just close by saying uh, that I think that the breadth and intent of the Tri-Council policy is really forward thinking and appropriate and uh, its implementation and technical solutions bring up a whole host of issues um, that I think we're making a lot of progress on here, uh, uh, here in Canada and more broadly abroad. Um, and thank you. I'll turn it over to Daniel now. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for sticking around until the end of the session. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm coming to you from New York, which is the traditional homelands of the Lenape people, but I uh, spent the bulk of my life in Canada and was fully educated through the Canadian system. So it's such a pleasure to be able to engage uh, with the tri-agency today. So at the the reason why I was asked to present this session it is to give a perspective from the researcher and what it means to actually make research data sharing successful from a use perspective. I come to this topic as an applied social science researcher. Um, as was explained, I work for a not-for-profit research organization and we have spent a considerable number of years exploring how researchers actually do their work, as well as instructors in a variety of fields. I've listed here all of the fields we've done research on, where we've taken deep dives into information and technology practices, including data sharing. And I highlight in particular two studies that we'll have coming out at the end of the year, one which is on how researchers work with big data, and the other which is on how instructors teach with data in the social sciences. But all of the projects that I have highlighted here have talked, uh, touched upon data practices in one way or another. And our research is done uh, completely for the public um, and to serve the public good, particularly geared towards librarians, those working in IT, uh, scholarly societies and the like. Just to give you a sense of the sheer volume of data we've collected on researcher practices, we've done over 2000 interviews, We've uh, collaborated with 550 librarians to conduct the research and we've worked with 145 institutions over time. We have done a meta-analysis across the various fields we've studied and a major issue that we uh, have found to be of interest is what actually makes data sharing successful. When we look across a variety of fields and disciplines, we were able to surface a number of really interesting examples. Uh, particularly in genetics, um, although I'll also um, highlight that there's a lot of interesting work being done in neuroimaging. And this is an issue uh, that is really top of mind given uh, what has been going on with the pandemic. Uh, one really interesting example is of the global initiative on sharing all influenza data. This is an interdisciplinary organization, including a repository of genetic data and related projects on influenza um, that was really, really important during the pandemic. What we see when we look at examples like GizAid and, and, and other examples from genetics or neuroimaging is that the reason why certain initiatives are really successful when it comes to data sharing is because they represent the work of an actual community. So at Ithaca, we've developed a concept for what makes data sharing successful, and that is the concept of the data community. We define it as a fluid or an informal network of researchers who share and use a certain type of data. They are typically facilitated through a website or some sort of online repository um, and has been you know, explored elsewhere today in this session. Um, these, there can be various kinds of repositories that can help support this, whether it be generalist or domain or through an institution. Um, but most notably, what makes data communities especially compelling is that they're not the same as a discipline. In fact, they're typically interdisciplinary. 
So going back to the example of uh, Giz Aid, for example, this is being used uh, not only by public health researchers, but those in the government, and even those within animal sciences. I think that this is especially important for anybody who is involved with trying to enact uh, an ambitious policy, such as what uh, we have going on right now with the tri-agencies, because thinking in terms of data communities can support sharing across institutional boundaries, and this mirrors how scholars actually do their work. Some of the characteristics we've explored over time at Ithaca SNR through um, our data community spotlight series are, are things like the bottom up development. So the reality that policy or requirements can only get you so far that a lot of the best data sharing happens because there's actually a need and an interest by a research community. Uh, then there's the reality that there are certain community norms that have to be agreed upon. And a really great example of this, again, through uh, GizAid is the fact that um, it, unlike a lot of other data repositories, there's, a, there's not an, an anonymous or non-PI em emphasis on what is shared. And this was in response to how the researchers actually do their work. PI is really important. Finally is the issue of absence or mitigation of technical barriers. There are data communities that have been around since the 60s, most notably the Cambridge Structural Database, and that's because uh, the nature of what is being shared is relatively easier, straightforward. What's great about technology, though, is it's a moving target, and what may have been very challenging to make into a data community even three to five years ago is still really possible for the future, and that's why it's important for us to keep uh, a, a pulse on what researchers are up to and what they need. Something that came up earlier in today's session from Bo is the idea that uh, part of the challenge in data management and data sharing is that repositories can disappear. Um, we've seen this firsthand in our research at Ithaca. We call it the data community circle of life. There is the reality that a lot of data communities don't exist forever. They may lose their support or the need may not be there anymore. And I think Bo makes a really good point about the importance of preservation. Because even when a community isn't necessarily active anymore, it doesn't mean that some component of what they were working on could have future value to other researchers. I'd like to spend the remaining amount of my time really emphasizing the importance of working with emergent data communities. That this is a place where those who are in different kinds of support roles within higher education or the government can really make an impact for the research community. An emergent data community is a group of scholars who are enthusiastic about sharing and reusing a certain type of data, but haven't yet fully established the necessary processes and infrastructure. We've observed through our research at Ithaca that there are often interested researchers and they start to explore processes or infrastructure to facilitate data sharing within their areas of research. Um, and then there needs to be this jump to long-term sustain sustainability that involves uh, getting much more of the community in, on board, but also making sure to establish appropriate norms and uh, infrastructure. I wanted to give one example from the Canadian context of what I would can argue is a, an emergent data community. And that's the Spoken Word Project, which is a shirk funded project to identify, preserve, and make available liter literary audio recordings, which are in essence documented performances and conversations typically related to literary works. What's especially interesting about this example is it's not from the STEM community, which is often where a lot of these conversations uh, are, are dominating. And uh, there are really interesting examples from the humanities and the humanistic social sciences as well. What I love about this project are the ways that it really scaffolds onto what is needed to take an emergent data community and help it start to establish itself. So there is the bottom-up development. Spoken Web um, pairs with inter in interested researchers and they get a librarian collaborator. Um, the reality is, is that there are limits to what humanists can do on their own. So taking interested researchers and pairing them with information professionals helps bridge a gap. Then there's the reality of community norms. Spoken Web has a component of it, which involves running work, a workshop to help researchers identify the data and the file types 
that they that are needed in this space, which is quite complicated, and also on building shared metadata schema for project partners. So these workshops are creating a shared understanding. The community norms are being developed in real time to help build the data community. And finally is the issue of technical barriers. This is the explicit goal of the project because it has been such an issue in the past with audio recordings and having that professional expertise and dedicated funding really is the way forward to make it possible for a community like this. So in, to just sum up, what do data communities need um, especially those that are emerging. And this is where universities and the government can really step in. They need help building and identifying existing repository infrastructure. They need technical and policy advice on metadata, vocabularies, preservation, privacy, and the like. They need guidance and advocacy for achieving organizational and financial sustainability. And they simply need help getting the word out to researchers who might be interested in getting involved because that really is how you scale something over time. So on the Ithaca front, we will continue to be doing applied social science research that, uh, that is made public at a large scale. We um, are actually in the process of developing an assessment tool for institutions to assess their data services, which may be, may be of interest to some folks on the call. We did a study of uh, data services in the US that uh, in 2020 and the assessment that we are developing would be a way for institutions to benchmark themselves against um, the, the, the greater landscape. We are also uh, have an NSF project, uh, which is a convening where we will be bringing together a variety of data communities um, to explore how they can work productively with information, information technology professionals. In the US and in NSF particular, there's a strong emphasis on voluntary data sharing. And so that is a, a strong emphasis of that convening. If you're interested in learning more about the kinds of research we do, I would recommend checking out our data communities issue brief where we go into far more detail about how some of these historic data communities um, like Cambridge Structural Database work and why, why they're compelling. Uh, uh, we have a, a, a companion report about the uh, data service analysis we did in 2020, and we have a series of blog posts on emergent data communities like the Spoken Web Project. Uh, so thank you so much for listening, and uh, please feel free to always uh, get in touch uh, if you're interested in, in learning more. Thanks so much, Danielle, and thanks to all of our speakers for uh, a lot of really interesting perspectives on what's happening with data deposit. Um, so we're at about four minutes to the top of the hour you know, in uh, in the places where it's the hour, and we have about uh, it's four minutes to the bottom of the hour in Newfoundland. Um, Nick, should we take well, another break before we uh, before we move into the Q and A session? Yeah, what does five minutes sound good? Give people a chance to refresh and stick around if they'd like to. Yeah, let's meet back at one minute past the hour or 31 in Newfoundland and uh, everyone can have a little stretch, a little walk, and we'll be, uh, we'll be back online very soon. Great, I'll see you all in five minutes. <laughs>